So I know you've just heard about exams, so your energy level is pretty high right now. But let's just try. Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. So I'm thrilled to be here with you at the end of this launch. Hopefully at the end of this week, after two, three weeks of this, you've known a little bit more about yourself, built some skills. You've learned about your classmates. You've learned about the school, your colleges, and the university. And you've been thinking about the world. And hopefully you're now excited for this next phase of this journey together. So our logo, just up here, has two bits, as you always know. And I'd like to focus on two words. One is business and one is Oxford. So what does it mean to be a businesswoman or a businessman who went to Oxford? What are the things that we would associate with that? I think we'd think, we'd hope, that the person would be successful. We might have different definitions of what success means. But whatever the definition, we would think that an Oxford businesswoman or businessman would be successful. We would think that they'd be a leader, right? In that, well, what does leadership mean? It's something you're going to explore over the course of this year. But in different ways, people lead. And we'd expect an Oxford business leader to be a leader. We'd expect them to think deeply. While we have a bias to action, we're a thinking place. We actually are introspective. We are looking not only at micro phenomena, but macro phenomena. You'd expect somebody who'd be thinking about the world. You'd expect them to be willing to speak out, to say what they mean, to tell other people what's important. And perhaps above all, you'd expect them to represent the values that we uphold, which is to say there's a low road and a high road in most circumstances. And hopefully, we're all going to take the high road. So that, success, leadership, deep thought, the willingness to speak out, and representing high values. How do we exemplify that? Well, it's really easy. Dominic Barton. Dominic, who's here today, is an Oxford graduate, a uh, Rhodes Scholar. Uh, in addition to that, he studied, he's, he's from Canada originally. Any Canadians here? <laughs> Um, he has spent 29 years at McKinsey. He is now the global managing partner. For those of you who can't decode consulting speak, he's the boss of McKinsey. Uh, he has run the Korea activities for McKinsey, the Asia activities for McKinsey. And McKinsey went through a dark period a few years ago, and the partners of the firm asked Don Dominic to come and lead them through this. He's one of the most prolific authors for about responsibility, about sustainability, about innovation. Uh, he's a deep thinker. And above all, he exemplifies the values that are important. Beyond all that, I'm exceptionally proud to say that Dominic is on our school board. So he is on the board that sits over this school. With that, I'd like to introduce Dominic Barton. Thank you so much, Peter. Can you hear me OK? Well, it's a, it's a real honor to be here. I'm, I have to actually say I'm, I'm jealous, because you guys are going to be leading um, in a world that I think is going to be some of the most exciting times in our history. And you're, I, I think you're in the best place to be to learn about leadership. And I, I just look in the group here at how international and global you are, which is where obviously the world is moving. But there are not many institutions that kind of provide that kind of perspective. So again, I'm really honored to be here. And I'm excited. And thank you, Peter, for, for having me. Um, what I wanted to do over the next uh, 30 minutes or so is just give you a bit of a view of, of what we think leadership is going to be in the 21st century. And, um, and I'm going to start with a bit of a context of how we think the world is changing, because I don't think you can think about leadership separate from the context in which the leader is leading, right? So we can have a leader that was terrific in the 1990s may not be a very good leader uh, in this period of time, which we're going to go through a lot of changes. We're going to talk a little bit about that. The background on it is one of the rules I have for myself when I took on this role about six years ago is that I must meet two CEOs or government leaders a day. I, because I joined McKinsey to do external work, not internal work. And so I've done that. And, and what I've always asked those leaders uh, are, what are the three things you wish you'd learned, particularly at the end of their career as a CEO, what do you wish you learned at the beginning of your term as a CEO that you know now? And what are the three things that you worry 
the most about or are excited the most about. And that's what sort of percolates through this material. I'm going to leave about uh, 10 minutes or so for questions or anything like that. If you, so please fire any questions at me as I go through it. So let me get, uh, let, get going. So the context that I want to talk about at the beginning is uh, that there are really five major forces that are at work right now. They have been for at least the last 10 years, but they're accelerating. And these five forces all together are going to lead to a time of, of <coughs> tremendous disruption. Uh, again, I'm an optimist, so I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities from that. Uh, but there will be a lot of volatility as we go through it. And I would argue, in fact, that any one of these five forces would make the next 10 to 15 years exciting. So I'm, I'm just going to quickly go through this. Um, there's the rise of the emerging markets. This is the fact that you know, we are going to see 2.2 billion new middle-class consumers coming into the system, into the world in the next 15 years. We've never seen that, that amount uh, in our history. It's about 1,000 times bigger than the Industrial Revolution. It's happening very quickly. Technology, uh, you probably can teach me more about that technology than I can teach you. But I will say that I, I believe that we're in chapter one of a 100-chapter book. I've actually st <laughs> stolen that from Larry Summers, who talks about the, the technological disruption, which is significant now, is still very much in the early stages. But it is a huge issue for businesses and government leaders uh, as we look out. We have an aging population, unless you're from... Uh, India or you're from the African continent, uh, we have a very aging population. Um, and that's going to have different dynamics in things like labor productivity because a big <coughs> chunk of labor productivity is when you have more people coming into the workforce. Um, when you have, if we keep our retirement ages at the way they do, we're going to have a problem on that dimension. You have health care costs, which are 75% uh, of health care costs occur in the last three years of someone's life. Um, and as we get older, that's going to be a big increasing burden on governments uh, as they go through it. We're a more integrated world. This is data flows. We know about trade and capital flows. What we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about is data flows, in spite of the recent ruling in the EU uh, about flows going from Europe to the US. The fact is that we're having much more data that's flying between the pla and, and we're going to see more people, this uh, migration issue, we believe, is actually a very early stage of a very major force that will, uh, will occur. We'll talk more about that. And then it's the return of geopolitics. When, when I joined McKinsey in 1986, I'd say it was sort of at the, I don't know, Peter, at the epicenter or, or the time of global capital markets dominated nation states. It was kind of like nation states didn't really matter. And it was, that was crystallized when George Soros took on the Bank of England, a, a sort of a hedge fund uh, trader took on the Bank of England, I think it was in 1991, and won. So you had, a, you had, a, you had an individual in the capital markets forcing uh, the bank to uh, devalue uh, at, at that time. And that was seen as, you know, if you're not paying attention to the capital markets, you can forget about it. Politicians should be careful about what's going on with the capital markets, or they're, or they're going to be in difficulty. I think that's a very different world that we're in now. Now, now nation states and geopolitical tensions matter a lot. And it's affecting how multinational companies are actually set up what they do. I can talk a little bit about more of that. So those are the five trends. And I'm just going to quickly punch through a few of the things on it. One, one way to look at the significance of the shift in economic power from the west to the east, this is the middle class growth, is if you were to balance the earth on a flat piece of paper and sort of say, where's the middle of it? In, in the year uh, zero, uh, it was roughly near uh, Af the whereabouts of Afghanistan. And over a 2,000-year period, moved towards Iceland as Western Europe and the US economies uh, took flight. The, the interesting thing, I think, is that uh, over the next 75 years, we're going to go back that distance it took us 2,000 years to go through. So we're going to go back. So history actually matters a lot. One of the my areas of passion is the Silk Road, uh, which was the largest trading route on Earth uh, for about 1,000 years. Uh, the, the Silk Road today is the fastest growing trade route on Earth, right? And it's not just oil uh, that's going back and forth. It's capital, it's people, it's investment. So this is Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. These are, these are important areas of, of the future of the world. And it's not a surprise to me that the Chinese government is putting a huge emphasis 
on this uh, Asia Infrastructure Bank, which is really to help finance the growth of that. Um, this is the 2.2 billion middle class consumers. Again, we've never seen anything of that scale. This is why I'm actually an optimist over time when we talk about commodity prices and where things are, that they're going to go back up. There's no way that those 2.2 billion people who want to consume and eat and live like we all do, uh, they're going to consume more copper and nickel uh, and food as we, as, we get through, as we get through this. Um, Africa is a, is a continent that I think we way underappreciate, uh, just this, the size of it, per, partly because of just how our maps are done. That Mercator you know, um, presentation of the world makes Greenland look bigger than Africa. Uh, but actually, when you see what's inside, what you could put inside Africa, it's a very different story. And that is the youngest population on Earth. The, you know, today, I don't know if there's anyone here from Nigeria. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Super. Well, you know, Nigeria is a place that all of us should pay attention to. It's the, uh, it is a, if, if you are in the diaper business, for example, you, if, so if you're Unilever or Procter & Gamble, if you don't have a significant business in Nigeria, you are irrelevant, I'd argue. There are more babies born in Nigeria than all of Europe combined this year. That's just the, the scale of it. It's got a very vibrant, uh, uh, young, dynamic population. And I think, and it's, it's the one country in Africa that we think itself will get to a billion people, right? So just think about what's going to be happening in that part of the world. Uh, lots of global resources, but also a very significant um, rising middle class. It's a consumption-driven growth is driven. I think it's the stability that's there. So I think we don't spend enough time thinking about Africa. I would urge you, as you think about your next 10 years in your career, that you spend some time in Africa, working in Africa, because that is going to be very much uh, where the future, uh, future is. Before I, I jump to the technology, one of the challenges, I would argue, though, with this 2.2 billion and this rapid change in, in growth patterns is we're going to have a lot of challenges in natural resources. Uh, so while we have oil prices that are, that are you know, quite low today, $45, $50, um, I don't believe that that, even with all of the technological improvements, because the demand is going to stay at that level. In McKinsey, we think it's roughly $60 to $70. By the way, don't bet on that because we, McKinsey, was, McKinsey was the firm in 1990 in doing work for AT&T that predicted that the total demand for cell phones globally would be 90,000. Uh, that was our, our prediction uh, on that side. So you might want to put that into some perspective. Um, but we've got, you know, we, we've, I, th I think one of the big challenges, we're going to have resource scarcity. You know, we today... Uh, consume about one and a half planets uh, to be able to keep the current system moving. And again, we have more and more people that are rightly having their role in the system. If we don't consume differently our resources, uh, we're going to cause significant issues. So climate change, sustainability is a business issue. It's not, a, it's not an issue that government needs to deal with or someone, biz, CEOs need to own that. And I'm going to talk about some who are. It's about being responsible. Uh, for where you, where you are. Food, ag food, I believe, is going to be one of the most exciting industries in the future. If I was to say to you, you know, farming is a good thing to go, and you'd probably think I'm, I'm crazy, but ag food is actually, I think, one of the most dynamic, high-tech, important industries uh, over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And it's, it's very much, to us, like the mining industry was 30 years ago, very um, you know, fragmented. It's going to have a lot of changes in that system. Uh, over time. Technology is the second force. Um, we, we, again, drawing on others, given our uh, cell phone example, we draw in a lot of people from the Santa Fe Institute um, and, for, and Hal Varian from Google, tried to estimate what, were, what would be the dozen disruptors uh, in technology. And we all know about the mobile internet, the automation of knowledge work. That's, by the way, affecting McKinsey, too. A lot of what we do can now be done by machine. Uh, right? We need to think about it. Our estimate is that 55% of tasks that we do today can be automated uh, over the next 10 years, 55% of them. A lot of exams are being uh, done, not, not multiple choice, but actually written papers uh, by machines. Uh, the Internet of Things, when we talk about robotics, uh, energy storage is a very big uh, game changer in terms of what that does for 
distribution of power, what it does for the automotive industry and, and others. Uh, 3D printing, you probably heard about you know, a lot of the advances going on that side about the, you know, being able to take a duck. And if you heard about the, I think it's called uh, Cletus, the duck that had two left feet and they basically um, you know, photographed the left foot and then sort of turned it around and printed out a workable right foot and attached it to the duck. I mean, that's a sort of a, and I think we're gonna to start to see that with, with uh, organs and things like that, let alone what we do in technology. So lots of changes that are underway. You know how much it's affecting all of our individual lives. I mean, this is just, this is trying to just look at, as an individual, there's almost every single aspect of what we do um, is, is being disrupted or changed by technology, right? Everything from how you order your food to even how you get some of your education, uh, when you think about a you know, getting a taxi and so forth. The thing I would just say here is it's, the technology change is not just making life easier, is actually making things better for the consumer and so forth. It's also changing at core assumptions of what we do. So what I, I think the biggest impact of what uh, Uber and Airbnb have done is kind of really put the shared economy onto the table. I did, when I was doing economics here at Oxford, I don't even, God, I don't even know how long ago, I don't know, that was too long ago, 30 years. I mean, if you said shared economy, people would have just laughed you out and said, I don't even know what you're, what are you talking about? I don't understand what that is. If, I would argue 10 years ago, if that was said, people wouldn't know. But some core assumptions that, that a marginal costs uh, always have to be greater than zero is not the case in many of the technologies uh, that are out here. So there are a lot of core assumptions, orthodoxies about how we think are gonna have to change. And what I find is that those orthodoxies are very difficult to change because people have been taught them for years and years. And one of the things I think you need to think about as a leader is challenge your orthodoxies. Why are we doing the things the way we do them? Do we really need to do them that way, <coughs> just for the sake of it? And I'll talk about some leaders uh, on that. Um, I, I was actually at a, a group uh, with a group of about 100 veterinarians about three weeks ago in Vancouver. We were opening up a Vancouver office, and I was stunned at the, the, the discussion. One of the discussions going on was, will we have any jobs 10 years from now? These were vets talking, and they're basically saying that with sensors and data analytics, that the need for the number of veterinarians is gonna be dropped significantly. You still need vets, but they're gonna be uh, much more empowered, if you will, by data and sensors. So even a cow uh, today, if you, this is a pretty basic sensor, they can tell uh, how much the, co the cow is chewing its cud, which gives a signal as to when it wants to be milked. So, so cows become self-milking. They'll decide to go in to get milked with automated machines. They can look at the uh, blood types to know whether the cow's getting sick or not way ahead of time. So it's again the application of big data analytics, sensors, even for a farm animal uh, is, are, is changing things. Um, the Internet of Things is also a, a very big shift. And this is, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Jeff email to GE because they've just, they're, they're undergoing what he says is their biggest transformation that they've done. They're moving from a manufacturing industrial company to more of a software company. And the trigger for him in, personally was he, well, they build locomotives. That's one of the, one of the many uh, businesses. They build jet engines and other things in the locomotive. And GE focused very much on you know, the metal that was used in the wheels, the power of the locomotive, <laughs> the energy consumption. When you actually think about the, the value of a locomotive, the way you look at that is its average speed per day. And the average speed of a locomotive is about 22 miles an hour per day during 24 hours. That's the average speed. If you're able to increase that average speed by one mile an hour, which isn't very much, if you're Burlington Northern, which is a big uh, American railroad company, that gives you about $250 million more of profit. So. It isn't just making the machine, it's how that machine is used, how you deal with congestion in the Chicago yards, how you think about preventative maintenance, because you don't want that locomotive taken off the track. You want to repair and do things while it's still moving. Um, and that's when Jeff Emelt said, you know what's going to happen? We make these machines, and some internet startup's going to come along and actually provide that capability, which actually provides a huge amount of value to the company, and will be 
in the Stone Age, and we won't be in this part of the world. And that was part of the, the, the drive of, of, of why they're shifting. They also found out, by the way, that they're actually one of the largest software companies in, in uh, the United States in terms of the number of engineers that they actually have. The aging population, as I mentioned, as I get older now, I think this is a very good thing that we have a lot of old people uh, in, in the system. But the, 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 one of the challenges is just, the, is just thinking about the numbers here. We're going to have 400 million people over the age of 80. The other one, first time in history, we'll have more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 14. That's, that's going to be a very different type of an environment to be working in. I was in Spain about three weeks ago, and I met the CEO of Renfa, which is the, are there any people from Spain here? It's the Spanish railroad company. And um, their average retirement age is 61. That, sorry, their, their required retirement age is 61. The average age of a worker, that's all the employees in Renfa, is 54. And the average age of the executive team is 58. And that's, that's, that's so this is happening now. This is not a way out there in the future. There, and so youth is going to be fundamentally important. That's why another reason why I think we miss uh, understand the importance of Africa and what that's going to be doing, because we need talent. Uh, India as well, having a lot of talent. So the, anyhow, the aging population is something that we're going to need to look at. I mentioned the integrating world. Uh, this is not just about, again, uh, trade. Uh, but it's also, again, about data uh, that we're seeing. And this is something that is important. Those countries that are more connected by data uh, and these flows have much higher GDP uh, growth rates than those that are, are not. And this is an area that we're going to see a more change. A lot of the trade now is south-south. It's not going from west to east. It's south-south trade. It's the emerging markets to uh, emerging markets as we go through it. Geopolitics, I've mentioned, is a significant uh, issue. Um, this is affecting, you know, in McKinsey, we have a very large Russian practice. We have about uh, 35 partners in Russia. Um, what, when you have sanctions that are put on, and we have, and those are Russian colleagues, right? They're not people from overseas. How do you deal with that? We have Iran that we would like to open an office in, but because we're incorporated in the United States, that makes it difficult for us to be able to do things, even though our German clients want us to be doing lots of things. So this, this is a real issue, and that's a minor issue compared to some other uh, organizations that, for example, want to get involved in the, the Silk Road. Um, I'm just going to... One, one last page, just in the context, is if you look at the average lifetime of a company, in 1935, if you were in the S&P 500, which is, means you're a pretty successful company, and 1935 wasn't exactly a great period of time in history, you'd last typically 90 years. In 2011, which is the last time we did this, the average uh, uh, lifetime was 18 years. So you're, you're seeing a churn rate of companies at a level we haven't seen. And I look at this chart because McKinsey is coming up to its 90th anniversary <laughs> next year. So I are we innovating or changing enough to keep up uh, with what's going on? So I'm going to quickly, just in five minutes, go through some of the leadership side of things. Uh, and I. I've tried to array this. This is just the first time I'm doing it here with you guys, so you have to tell me whether this works or not. But I tried to break it into three components. I think much more about leadership needs to be focused on character, who a leader is, as opposed to what a leader does. Most of the management uh, practices that were taught when I was going through the system is what does a leader do? How do you spend your time? How do you align an organization? How do you put in the right KPIs? It was much more on the what leaders do. We think that way more emphasis has to be on who leaders are, because we can't predict what even the businesses are going to be and the dynamics that are going on. And we found that those leaders that are most successful in this environment are very strong characters. And that's things like having a purpose. You, it is, and purpose, in my view, is not about, if you're a businessman about, or a businesswoman, increasing shareholder value, maximizing shareholder value. That is a very narrow and, I would argue, unsustainable way. You will not, your organization will not be successful over the long term if that's what your, your, foc your singular focus is. Persistence and drive. Uh, I'm going to show you some charts of people on this. Selflessness. We found that the most successful 
leaders are those that are actually not the most into themselves. That's quite a difficult thing because when someone's been a CEO for a while, they actually, everyone's saying, every one of their jokes is funny, uh, interestingly <laughs> enough. Uh, no one really criticizes them. Uh, and it's a, you can get caught up in a space uh, that's not very health, healthy for your, for your organization. Uh, judgment, having the judgment because you can't get, even with all this data analytics, all the information you need to make a decision, you're gonna have to use your gut in, in how you drive it. But then you're going to have to make a call. A lot of leaders panic or don't want to make a big decision when they need to. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. Um, and then also being able to absorb issues. There's lots of volatility. And as a leader, you, one of your jobs is actually just to absorb it for the organization. It's not a very fun part of the job, but it is part of the job. You have to absorb the shocks. And you can't go screaming and yelling and uh, whining about it. You've, you've just got, you've got to absorb it. You may want to do it privately with some friends and so forth, but part of your job is also absorbing it. And then when we think about behaviors that you need to have, it's much more about managing your energy than your time. It's not time matters, but I found most CEOs and, and government leaders are much more focused on how they manage their energy. What gives them energy versus sucks the energy out of them. Having a telescope and microscope, this is the idea that you need to be thinking long term at the same time you're thinking short term. I actually learned this from the former Minister of Finance in uh, Canada, Jim Flaherty, who played a key role in uh, uh, the, the, the financial crisis and in, in turning things around. And that was one of the things he wished he'd learned to do early on, is have that. And if you, he said, he's never done it, he said, if, if you ever try and put a microscope and telescope in each eye, you'd probably get a headache. Uh, but the po point is you have to do both. And many leaders are either one or the other. Radar and lightning rod. This is about, about having just a standing out there and having a view of what's going on, looking around the corner, getting a sense of what's happening uh, from different sectors. Learning how to influence without authority. That is a very important skill that we don't talk enough about. People, people don't want to be told what to do. People want to be motivated and led by example. And that takes longer, and there's a certain way. Some people don't have the patience for it. And then I think there's just some tactics which are around uh, being a chief people officer and setting a bold ambition. I'm just, is this okay for time? Are you guys okay? Yeah. So let me just go through. One, one person who is a bit of a hero for me on, on uh, purpose and resilience, you can read the quote he put out there. But when he took on his role in 2010, he basically said, I'm going to double our revenues and I'm going to half our carbon footprint. Again, he, you see how he's bringing the the profit and the sustainability side. And he is an absolute advocate on the sustainability side of things. He, because he believes it's, because he's a business person. He's not doing it for corporate social responsibility. He's doing it because it's important for the business to be successful. He also, with, along with Peter Tofano, is a big proponent of this, what I call more the long-term capitalism, which is, he, he, when he came into his role, he said, I'm not gonna give quarterly guidance anymore. I'm stopping it because it's too short term. And his stock dropped about 5%. And he realized, he said, it's, it's easy to lose an investor than to gain an investor. But what ended up happening was he got the right investors. The longer term investors came in to support him and what he's trying to drive. So that's just a model. And I, I think it would be, you'd be very hard pressed to find an organization, a business organization that's global today that's not thinking about what's their purpose. Because if they don't have a sense of purpose, I don't think they're going to be able to navigate them their way through things. It's also important for, for talent. Elon Musk, persistence and drive. You could, I would probably also say courage. I mean, just this notion of saying, I'm going to look for industries with high margins and inefficiencies, and I'm going to attack them. And to think that someone would actually go after the space industry is just, I, I think it's preposterous. It's just, but he's done it, and, and he's doing it. And I don't think he's a crazy guy. Uh, but he's someone, again, who's just got a, a systematic approach, but a, again, a, 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 he, he has his own sense of, of purpose, and then he has a persistence and drive. He's had many setbacks and, uh, and failures. Another one, this has nothing to do with business, but always inspired me, was a, um, a man in the northeast of India whose wife died because they couldn't get her to a hospital in time because the, the hospital was 70 kilometers away. So he spent the next 22 years of his life basically building a road through the mountains to, to reduce it. That, that's, 
to me, the epitome of drive, if you will. To do, and again, it's probably a bit extreme. I'm not suggesting you go do that uh, type of thing. But it's a, just a sense of, the, of focus. Uh, selflessness and broad-mindedness. This Shimon Perez is a, a person who, I think he's 92 right now. His m main focus is actually on leadership. And he thinks leaders uh, are not being servants enough. He says, if you're a leader, you're a servant. And too many of our leaders today want to be leaders and not servants. And I just think it's something, as you, you think about in seeing many, many different uh, leaders. Um, selflessness and broad-mindedness. This is Ted Hall from Liberty Mutual. And I was asking him about succession planning. How do you think about you know, when you have to re replace yourself in your organization? And what he did was he decided to go to the US military. He said, you know, when they uh, take someone who's a three-star general and make them a four-star general, that's a pretty big deal. And he said, I'm going to learn about how they do it, that sort of succession planning. And he booked an afternoon to go and visit uh, with the people that are involved in doing that. And it turned out the visit took about 15 minutes because it was a very quick, clear answer. And the answer was, we just look for two things when we're trying to make the difference between a three-star and a four-star general. And we look for selflessness and we look for judgment. Those are the two things that they look for. And again, it's interesting that you see that in, a, in uh, that, or that uh, organization. Absorb and compartmentalize. Think about Mary Barra when she took on GM. They had one of the biggest uh, car recalls in history. I mean, she was battered in the beginning uh, year of what she did. But she's had, a, I think she did a phenomenal job of absorbing things for the organization in many ways, even though it wasn't, quote unquote, her fault. She, she took responsibility and said, I'm just taking this on. I'm not going to sit there and say, hey, I didn't do that. What are you doing? By the way, which is very different, and I want to be critical. If you could think about Tony Hayward, who was at BP when he came in, who was a, he is a phenomenal uh, person, by the way, one of the smartest people I've ever met. But he never had a setback before. He, everything was golden. And his first setback, unfortunately, was when he was the CEO, when the well blew up. And he could argue that wasn't my fault. I, mean, I, I wasn't. I didn't make that, you know, that was done by the previous leadership. But the public doesn't really want to hear that type of thing. And neither does the organization uh, as, as you go through it. Um, judgment and decisiveness, again, I think what uh, Jeff Emilt did in, in sort of just in fundamentally shifting the company um, has been something that has been, I, I think has had a lot of, he's someone I also learned a lot about leadership from. And this was in 2011 when I met him and I said, what have you guys learned? Because GE is known as a leadership factory. What have you learned since the financial crisis about leadership? And what he told me was, and he said, if, when I think about the 10 people that I had as direct reports, he said, in the crisis, two of them cracked like glass when the temperature got up to 1,400 degrees. Two of them cracked. And these are people, right, who've turned around businesses, established new businesses, worked all over the world. They've been put under extreme circumstances. But two of them weren't able to handle it. When, you know, if you remember at one point, GE was in danger of even getting financing from the Fed to keep their commercial paper going. They were, they were in deep, deep trouble in the heart of it. Two people cracked. And he said, the problem is you can't cook people up to 1,400 degrees and see if they'll crack. You're just going to know it or you're not. And I said, well, what are you doing then? What, what's, what are you doing about it? And he says, well, you know, you may not want to quote it this way, but I basically, I have sleepovers. I have, I have my executive team come and stay one at a time at my home for two nights. And they stay with me, my family. And I just get to, I get a bit more of a sense of what they're like as people. Because everything I looked at was their performance, their derive, their business. I didn't get a sense of their what they're like as people. Um, so I don't think sleepovers are going to be a new business concept in the school, but that. Uh, Marilyn Houston at Lockheed Martin, she's someone too. Again, a, sometimes it's most difficult for successful companies to change, because most people say, why are we trying to change? And so what she saw was that defense spending was going to go through significant change in the United States over time. And so she shifted. Uh, the business very much uh, into new areas, which was, v for the 
for the senior people in the organization and for the alumni of this organization, that was the toughest group of people to, to, uh, to deal with. Klaus Kleinfeld, another one, again, fundamentally changing. You've read about what he's doing with Alcoa. He's broken the company into two parts. Uh, before that, he sort of said, we have to start moving into different businesses than aluminum, uh, given where we are. Again, this, and it, was, it was hard for a German coming into an iconic American company and basically disrupting uh, the traditions of what they were doing and, and where they are. He's done it. Carlos Ghosn, this is on managing energy. He's one of the longest standing CEOs that's out there. So I find it interesting talking with him about what was it like being a CEO when you were 45 or 10, 15 years ago, and what's it like now? And his sense now is it's just, it's much more about energy. And you can see, you know, I live like a night Templar, wake at a certain hour, sleep at a certain hour, certain things I won't. It's just very disciplined to be able to be on uh, all the time. A bit like uh, Andrew Liveris talking about one of the challenges is in a, it's a 24 seven world uh, that you're in now. You have to be uh, everywhere and you have to understand what people are saying about you and you have to be able to deal with it uh, very, very, uh, very, very quickly. Telescope and microscope, Randall Stevenson, um, again, anticipating significant trends that will change the business uh, over time. One of the things I just want to say again about responsible business leaders, he predicted that 90,000 of his 320,000 employees would no longer have work because of the technologies we talked about and the business changes. So he didn't do what a typical CEO might do, which is say, well, guess what? There's going to be no jobs for the 90,000. Let's just take a restructuring charge and move on. He said, you have the opportunity to retrain because there are skills that we don't have that we're going to need. So he built a program with uh, Georgia Tech and EduX, which is an internet uh, training company, to basically allow workers to recertify, get badges, to be able to get some of the jobs. So it was, again, in my view, taking responsibility for uh, his, his workers. Uh, Alex Gorski at uh, J&J &J is another person who I think is uh, someone who you just you always hear him asking questions. Some leaders talk all the time. Uh, the best ones, I think, ask questions. They're asking questions all the time. Why, why are you doing this? What's happening? They're also visiting unusual places to try and get insights, often, again, not in the sectors that they actually uh, operate in. I think Pope Francis is an epitome, of, in a way, of someone who influences. You could say he has authority to some degree, but he doesn't have authority between Cuba and the United States, for example but he played a role in that. I think what he's doing on climate change uh, was very courageous and, and bold uh, in, in where he is. Um, I'm going to just skip for the sake of time. KV Kamath, who now is the CEO of the BRICS Bank, he's one of my heroes. I, I worked with him uh, in, the, in the 1990s uh, and early 2000s in, in India. He's the one who single-handedly built the most women CEOs of actually any CEO that I know, three of the leading uh, women CEOs in India were actually mentored by him. He's a men he mentors people. That's what he loves to do and spends about 30% uh, of his time uh, doing that. And then my final page, I just is to put a Korean company up here, which is POSCO. And this is the notion of the bold ambition. And this is a picture of the POSCO pit in 1970. And what, what you see here is uh, on the right is President Park, the, the father of the current president in Korea. And on the left is T.J. Park, who's a businessman. And in 1970, Korea had one of the lowest GDPs per capita in the entire world. Very, very low, very poor, less than the Philippines. And what the president and a business leader said they would do is, we are going to build a steel company. Now, if you've been to Korea, you'll note Korea doesn't have any natural resources of note for steel. That's, that's for sure. Doesn't have power and doesn't have an economy that can drive it. And the World Bank told them five times, you cannot do this, and we will not fund you for doing it. And I know if McKinsey was there in 1970, we would have told them 100 times, do not do this. You are crazy. These guys built literally the most productive steel company in the world. POSCO is, a, is an extraordinarily organization, what they do. And this is about having the ambition. It's not bald ambition or crazy, it, it's, but it's having an ambition to drive things. And one of the things I find most frustrating in organizations is when you see a leader that doesn't have 
ambition. That is the most <coughs> debilitating thing you can imagine in an organization. So it's important to stretch and to push and to get people to reach uh, through it, and that's what, the, what they do. So, um, and again, I, I'm gonna skip through this. That, that's, I hope gives you a bit of a picture. I blathered on here for too long. I'm not, not a very good leader. I'm talking more than I'm listening to you guys. But I, but I hope that just gives you a picture. We're in a world uh, that is gonna be, I think, the most exciting that we've seen in history. That's a pretty bold statement to make, but I, I truly believe it. It's very much your world. You're gonna be leading in it. I'm gonna be in a wheelchair, so I hope the hell you do a good job uh, in where it is. Uh, but I think it's gonna require a different type of leadership than we've typically experienced in the past, and much more of it's gonna be on who you are as a, in terms of your character of leadership, what Peter said about take the high road, not the low road. And if you're doing business, please remember what Adam Smith said, who you know many people think is right of Genghis Khan. Adam Smith is the one who said, it's the duty of the entrepreneur to take care of the society in which they operate. Quite a broad-minded view uh, for, in a sense, one of the, the, the founders of capitalism on that side. So I hope I've just given you a bit of a view of that. I'll shut up. Uh, I don't know if there's any time for questions, but yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>